Hi, Pam. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm excellent. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Pamela Cooper White. You've been with us once before. Um, you are the Christiane Brooks Johnson Professor of Psychology and Religion at Union Theological Seminary, where I am visiting Professor of Science and Religion, um, and where we both are at this moment, I think, although in different rooms. You're, you're actually in the building, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, Modern so, technology. <laughs> yeah, isn't it amazing how it brings us uh, together, except does the opposite? Um, so uh, we're going to talk about Donald Trump, although in some cases not talk about Donald Trump, because you, uh, although you are a psychologist, uh, you are prohibited by the rules of your profession from diagnosing. What's the actual rule from diagnosing anyone without talking to them or something? What is it? Right. Um, just to be clear, I'm actually a pastoral counselor and a, a licensed uh, clinical professional counselor, mm -hmm. not a psychologist per se. Okay. But the ethics for all of the therapeutic professions are that you don't diagnose someone or publicly uh, give them a diagnosis without having actually treated them I or see. done an evaluation. So since I've never met the man, uh, I would not be able to give a diagnosis of him. So if Donald Trump wants us to talk about him, he will have to make an appointment with you. That's correct. And he, I, at the moment, he's busy. That, yeah, I'm at not expecting that busy. anytime soon. Some people think he'll have more free time. I'm not so sure uh, after the election. We'll see. But, um, but in any event, so we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, aspects of his psychology that have been uh, conjectured or asserted in various corners, certainly including a very, very prominent uh, kind of uh, remote diagnosis of narcissism. There was a whole Atlantic piece uh, some months ago that, that did that. We'll, we'll talk about what narcissism is and so on. If we have time, I may talk uh, to you about the other uh, aspect of your professional ID, which is that you are an ordained minister. And maybe we'll talk about Trump from that perspective. I had your, your uh, colleague, John Tatamanal, on some time ago talking about Trump. Tried to get him to muster some Christian charity for Trump. I would say I had limited or at least incomplete success. Okay. Um, and actually, and Trump's followers as well. Maybe I had more success on that front. Anyway, um, so talk a little about, well, whatever you want to talk about. Now, th this... If we're talking about narcissism, mm -hmm. um, that's an actual pathology in the, what's the official text, the DSM? You have it there? Right. Here it is. There it is, folks. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition. And, right. and narcissistic personality disorder is in there. Yes. And what, you know, again, you are not, it will not be your job today to say which of these things might or might not apply to Trump. I may be able to play a role there, uh, since I have no constraints on what I say, but why don't you just tell us, for starters, what what is this narcissism thing? Sure. Well, there, there are many ways of understanding it, but the official diagnostic manual lists things in terms of traits or diagnostic criteria, and so there are actually nine of those that are listed and a personality disorder just to back up and say this first a personality disorder is not the same thing as say um, a mental illness in the, on the level of schizophrenia or major clinical depression uh, it used to actually in the previous DSM be put on a, a different axis altogether what it is is an enduring set of personality traits that could bring someone in for treatment. Often with the personality disorders, people come in grudgingly for treatment because someone else has said, you go get therapy or I'm leaving you. I see. Uh, so whereas most other disorders are troubling to the person, him or herself, I see. these are disorders that tend to be most troubling to people around the person. So you don't, you don't hear people say, come in and say, I'm cripplingly disabled by my narcissism. It's never happened yet. Okay. <laughs> to me. And I doubt, it, I doubt Donald Trump has ever walked in and said that to anyone. Well, and honestly, the people who have, you know, whether casually or not so casually said, do you think 
I'm narcissistic and they're agonizing about it and they're feeling very anxious, that generally is a sign that they are not. Mm -hmm. So let me run down these, uh, these traits because that would kind of give us a benchmark of what's considered to be the criteria for what would invoke an actual diagnosis. Mm. So um, the overall uh, description here is a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, need for admiration, and lack of empathy, beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts as indicated by five or more of the following. Whoa. Can I, so, call, can I, can I just interject one thing here? It's interesting with these things and pathologies in general, in asking how many of them are just slightly amped up parts of normal human nature, right? Like, like in the New York Times, you may have seen this piece a couple of days ago, said uh, uh, a study of these Trump tapes uh, reveals that he has been driven by a fear of losing status. Well, welcome to the club. I think that describes everyone, so far as I know, uh, driven partly by a fear of losing status. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, the grandiosity, you know, I mean, we're all delusionally self-centered, right? Or not? <laughs> That's more of a, a question for philosophy, okay. right? Okay, then I'll let you proceed. Or, or maybe it would be St. Augustine, uh, you know, that, that we are all, or, or Martin Luther, we are all curved in on ourselves, and mm -hmm. so we can go to the theology. I see it on a spectrum mm -hmm. of behaviors and attitudes, and we could come back to that. Okay. But do you want to hear... Sure, the, what are the five... So this is your the menu out of which you need five to be diagnosed. Oh, you so, need five of these. Five of these nine, at to, least. And if I have five of these nine, am I a narcissist? Yeah. Okay, because I'm interested in doing both me and Trump. Maybe I'll keep score separately. <laughs> okay. uh, Trump, I'll have a Trump column and a me column. All right, that sounds good. Okay, that sounds good. let's go. Okay, so um, number one, has a grandiose sense of self-importance. For example, exaggerates achievements and talents. <laughs> expects to be recognized as superior without commensurate achievement. So that's a little different than someone who has realistic self-confidence. Right. So I'm giving Trump a yes on that. I don't think I'm going out on a limb here. Uh, I'm not so sure. I don't, think I, I don't think I necessarily get a yes there. So far, I'm good. Okay. okay. What's next? We're, we're one for one then. Mm -hmm. uh, two is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Unlimited is a pretty strong word. Yeah. And there, you know, I almost think we don't know enough about what goes insi on inside his head. I mean, for example, there was, there's been conjecture that when he got into the presidential race, he had no intention of actually winning. And it was just, he just thought he'd, you know, if he could get 15% in the primaries, it would help his brand and prominence. Um, I'm going to, I'm not going to necessarily, unlimited such a strong word. I'm not, I'm not going to give him a check mark there. Well, it's the the key words here too are preoccupied with fantasies of. Yeah, so again, I don't I, I, to imagine yourself as president of the United States probably goes beyond what most people realistically would imagine unless they had been in politics for a long time and had been working up the ladder. Yeah. Although don't many many people although it turned out not to be unrealistic. I mean, he's the Republican candidate. And also, oh, and also don't go. many, many people have, after their morning coffee, occasionally have fantasies that are not realistic? Don't, you know, don't we all have a little Walter Mitty in us? Well, this is preoccupied with fantasies. I'm not, I, I'm not going to give him, I'm not going to. No, gonna, I'm not arguing for Trump. Yeah. I'm just saying. Okay. No, it, he's one for two. beyond normal confidence, let yeah. us just say. I'll put a question mark there, but I think one for two. Maybe we'll revisit that. What's what's next? Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, I'm not arguing for a diagnosis here. Three, believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. Behaviorally, you would certainly infer as much. I mean, again, we don't know what goes on. His, and instead, we do know that he alone can solve it. And if he, that's pretty unique, if you alone can solve it. And, of course, you never know if a politician is just saying these things or believes them. Uh, I think I'm going to tentatively give him a check mark there. I think I'm going to tentatively give him a 
Can you say that one more time? That, that yeah, believes that he or she is special, and that's in quotation marks actually in the book, and unique, and can only be understood by or should associate with other people or high status people or institutions. Well, I think, you know, an issue we're going to face repeatedly is like with this, as we go down, this is probably, we'll see a lot of cases where his behavior would seem to suggest as much, but on the other hand, there is this question, is Trump in, in his own mind a pillar of self-confidence or a writhing mass of insecurity? Well, we're going to get to that okay. after we go through the list, because actually, you know, when you were talking earlier with me about, is there a way to view him with a certain amount of Christian charity or spiritual right. generosity? Uh, I think you have to get underneath the why of these things. But these are behavioral observations that a clinician would make in order to make the diagnosis. It actually isn't necessarily what the person is feeling deep down inside when you take off the mask. So a lot of this is actually, with a narcissist in particular, we're talking about a persona. We're talking about how they, they are compulsively needing to present themselves to the world in order to feel good. And the self-esteem underneath, I mean, the way you describe that as a you know, arriving mass of insecurity mm -hmm. is actually what is going on oh, for okay. most narcissistic personalities. Okay. But it's mostly not conscious because they can't tolerate that anxiety and that sense of emptiness. Okay. So. All right. So I will maybe be more liberal in my willingness to give him a check mark going forward. All right. Four is requires excessive admiration. Um. Well, you know what? Now here's the funny thing: is one thing I've said about him is he's an odd combination of desperately wanting attention and not necessarily insisting that the attention be favorable. I mean, it seems like he would rather people pay attention. He would rather 100 people pay attention to him than 20 pay attention to him and like him. He gives that sense, right, that he wants attention above all. Yeah, um, but there's another dimension to this, and I'm just speaking now about the category itself. Re requiring excessive admiration often goes with being extremely reactive to criticism, uh, rejecting it or always needing to have the, the externalization of responsibility. So I need to be admired or I need to be right oh. all the time. And if someone criticizes me, I have to deflect that by saying, no, it's they who are wrong or it's somebody else's problem. I am fine. Okay. Uh then I'll give him a yes with a question mark. But I do think there's a, there's a quote in that Atlantic piece where he says, I'll tell you, he's talking about whatever part of Florida he lives in. He says, I'm the king. I'll tell you, all these important people, they come and they eat. They, they, they eat at, at Mar-a-Lago or whatever it's called. And they, and, they, uh, and they say nice things to me and they kiss my ass. And then they go home and they say that I'm a jerk. But I'm still the king. You know, because they come and they and they say the nice things to his face. So this is, I don't know, that's a little, uh, uh, I'll give him a tentative yes. He's doing well. And, Two for four, three for four. And that goes back four. to number three also, needing to brag about associating with so-called important people. Yeah, I gave him a yes there. Yeah, right. yeah. So, okay, number five has a sense of entitlement. That is, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. So will you accept the results of the election? Well, only if it's what I want. <laughs> now, you're kind of coaching the witness at this point, I would say. Okay, okay. I'm the witness. I'm okay. the, uh, uh, but, um, but yeah, we got to give him, I mean, I was, you didn't have to add that for me to say, yeah, we're giving him a, a big check mark there. Well, he's already got four. Uh, he only, oh, he's got three and a maybe, and he only needs five. Yeah, we're still on number five here. Also, um, you know, and for an ordinary person, too, there are plenty of ordinary narcissists out there who don't rise as high as Donald Trump in an election. Uh, a narcissistic trait of entitlement would be, I'm so important and I'm so busy, I shouldn't have to stand in line at the bank. Mm -hmm. and so, so entitlement is really, I should get what I want because I'm me. No, I've got to say, he very much exudes that sense. 
Mm -hmm. But it's not unique to him. Right. You wouldn't have to be you wouldn't have to be running for president to be a narcissist. Right. Okay. Number six is interpersonally exploitive, i.e. takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. We see this a lot with professionals who are involved with sexual misconduct, for example. Uh, Just to take one example. Well, it, it's yeah. an area that I've done a lot of work on yeah. uh, and professional ethics. But you see this kind of exploitation in terms of objectification of other people mm -hmm. because I deserve to be gratified now in the way that I want to be gratified. And so I'm just going to take it whether or not the other person is actually consenting to it. Yeah, I mean, you know, like the account of uh, the woman who had been a contestant on The Apprentice, and it's consistent with the account of, like, the People magazine reporter, is obviously just totally consistent with that. And what's kind of interesting is how almost mechanical he was about it. The woman had come to him ostensibly for a, the, 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 uh, the person who had been on The Apprentice had come to him ostensibly for, like, a job interview, and he's, you know, kind of molesting her, you might say, in a room that where they're alone, and she resists, and, and, and finally he, uh, he ceases and desists, and then he's like, okay, let's have dinner. And, like, he goes through with that, and they order out, and he's, you know, and then he doesn't give her the job that she had thought she was going to get in the end, but uh, I, I, I think if we have time at the end, I'm going I'm to ask you about sociopathy, because, because it always strikes me that people who do these, some of these, uh, you know, or, or just people have a ton of like extramarital affairs and, and have it not intrude on their life. You just wonder, like, you know, in other words, they can then compartmentalize and go about their business, just shift to the next thing. Don't you almost have to have some sociopath in you to make such a graceful transition to the next part of your life without going, oh, I guess she hates me now, you know, without that being a problem. So anyway, we'll put that on hold, the possibility. Well, you know, we talk, we, I talked earlier about this, the idea that narcissism exists on a spectrum. And uh -huh. on the mild end, you would have the healthy, the health, there is such a thing you could think of as health, healthy narcissism, which mm -hmm. is kind of a little extra measure of bold self-confidence that many people have and need to have. I mean, I think anyone who runs for president needs to have a degree of healthy narcissism because to go through what you need to go through to do that, mm -hmm. it requires you to, to really believe in yourself as your cause on some level, um, or to believe that you are, you are someone who carries an important cause. Right. Uh, but within moderation and, and within some scope of realism, that's not necessarily pathological. On the other end of the spectrum, on the worst end of the spectrum, or the most pathological is, in fact, in my view, sociopathy. That that this sociopathy really is the extreme end of narcissism, in my theoretical understanding. Now you're not going to see that in the DSM. The DSM has other diagnostic markers for sociopathy, but there are similarities, and one of them is a profound absence of empathy for another person, plus the lack of remorse. Yeah. And you can't really have remorse if you don't have empathy. Yeah, exactly. So that's, well, that's very interesting. Most of us who have any degree of kind of public success would exist somewhere on the healthy end of that spectrum, hopefully, but there is, there are some wide variations. Okay. Okay, so the, the next, the next uh, diagnostic marker, in fact, number seven is lax empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. Mm-hmm. Now, this is interesting because, of course, he is presenting himself to his followers as being one of the few politicians who really cares about their plight. But I just see, I think, nothing in his, uh, in his history to suggest that there's actually empathy there. I mean, we know he, he, he can be just incredibly mean to people. Uh, when he sees their interests as opposed to his, but beyond that, I just I just don't see him ever uh, having a Mother Teresa side. There was a quote in that aforementioned Times piece where they said he's driven by a lack of status. I thought the most interesting quote. These were tapes that a a guy who was going to write a biography or maybe did write it or something or wrote a book about him. 
tapes the guy had gotten from interviewing Trump, but they had never been released before. And one of the things Trump said was, he said, you know, who do you respect or something? Anyway, he said, he said something like, yeah, I don't respect anybody. Nobody's worth respect or, or, or it's just like the average person out there is not worthy of respect or something. He just, he just seems to take a dismal view of people not named Donald Trump. Okay. So, that, so I got to give him a, I got to give him, and I think he's already, uh, we, I think we can ring the bell at this point and declare him the winner because we've got five yeses and a maybe, and it only takes five, right, to be a narcissist. Do you want to hear the, the last two? Sure. Let's see. I mean, let's, let's okay. go for the. But what I was going to say about that last thing, too, um, that's not in the DSM, but um, one of the ways in which a lack of empathy can, be sh um, can show up is in a very charismatic narcissistic person, right? Not everybody who's narcissistic is boorish right. and rude. Um, they may be arrogant, but they're not necessarily unlikable in every respect. Not all narcissists. And if manipulation is a quality, then it, some narcissists are extremely good at feigning empathy, mm -hmm. but they don't actually feel it. So you can be a charismatic, widely beloved, perhaps sociopathic narcissist. You could be. You could be. Um, I've noticed you've start you've stopped checking off the boxes for yourself, Bob. Are you are you telling? <laughs> well, I gotta say, I think in almost all these cases, his score is certainly higher than mine. Now, whether I, <laughs> you know, that was spoken like a true therapist. Pointing, That's pointing true. that out about me, and it That's makes me true. makes me uh, want to lie down on a couch and explore my inner depths. But sadly, time does not permit. So let's move on to okay. So number eight is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her. Well, he would not admit to envy of others. Um, I don't think very often. Uh, he would assume everyone is envious of him. Mm -hmm. uh, Wait, so they're saying uh, both, both of these things are what? Often envious of others and... Now, I suspect, I suspect he often is stricken by envy. I mean, I suspect whenever he sees some guy with a woman he considers beautiful, he's like, wait, that should be me. Why isn't it? Um, that kind of thing, right? Well, I think the way this would show up in a person would be, um, that, should be that should be mine. Mm -hmm. Or I should be in that position. I'm better than him. Right. Uh, so not being willing to see that other people might be more successful, so mm -hmm. that would engender jealousy. But at the same time, feeling like, well, of course, everyone's jealous of me because I'm so good. Mm -hmm. I have a little of that first part of like envying other people and thinking, wait, I should be that person. But I digress. Let's get back to Trump. And then the last one is nine. Shows wait, 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 I need to, sorry, I need to decide what I'm going to give him on eight. So I'm sure, I, I would think, it's a weird thing. I don't think he'd admit to envy. I think he would claim that others rightly envy him. I, I'm going to, I'm going to put a question mark on that for now. We don't, anyway, we don't need it. Well, it's it. a speculation. You don't have the evidence right. for that, but. Uh, this is why we don't diagnose them unless we've actually. That's exactly right. Interrogated them, right. Okay. And then on number nine, shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. That's pretty, that's a pretty broad. I think most people would say yes. Yeah. So, I mean, even if the question marks were no's, we would still have by my scorekeeping six of nine. He only needs five. And so. Well, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but then there's a whole descriptive couple of pages in the book that go further. And they say things like. Um, self-esteem is invariably very fragile, mm -hmm. although, you know, they require excessive admiration, um, need for constant attention and admiration. That's uh, totally him. Expect their arrival to be greeted with great fanfare and are astonished if others do not covet their possessions, fishing for compliments often with great charm. So they give some more, yeah. you know. Well, most of that sounded like dead on. So I do want to mention one, one factor under... Uh, antisocial personality disorder, which is listed as a separate disorder, and you and I have been talking about it as sort of the outer end of the spectrum of narcissism, but there are a couple of... Wait, is that, is that what we mean by sociopathic? 
Yeah, antisocial, antisocial, sociopathic, or psychopathic are synonyms. They all mean the same thing. Okay. And, again, uh, this includes deceitfulness as indicated by repeated lying, use of aliases or conning others for personal profit or pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm cherry picking here. Irritability and aggressiveness as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults. Uh, consistent irresponsibility. Uh, I mean, he. I can. I can say, he doesn't meet all of the criteria of antisocial personality disorder on the face of it. Just looking at his public behaviors, but there are what we would call traits, especially around the deceitfulness and the lying that you could point out. Yeah. So, but that also. That's where this this notion of a spectrum comes into play because narcissists also frequently lie. I mean, it it really doesn't matter to them so much about telling the truth as long as they're getting what they need. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so let me let me talk a little bit about what's going on underneath this person. A, a nar- not meaning Trump, but meaning a narcissist. A narcissistic person. Let's say somebody who's squarely in the middle of the spectrum, who has at least five of these traits, um, tends to believe in his or her own superiority, uh, and really doesn't have much empathy for anyone else. So on the surface, you have this very arrogant, superior person Mm -hmm. who comes across, may come across as very charming and manipulative, but at the end of the day people find this person to be quite arrogant. Mm -hmm. That would be a hallmark. And the more outwardly successful the narcissistic personality is, the harder it is to detect it right away because you might say that some of their their overt self-appraisal corresponds with the greatness of their success. Mm -hmm. But even in that instance, what's going on underneath this is that This is a person who actually, a lot of times people describe this as having a hole inside that can never be filled. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's an insatiable need to be admired, given attention, um, told you're special, told that you really have these outstanding traits. And one day's success only lasts, I mean, praise for a great outstanding performance of some kind only lasts until the applause dies. And then the, the insatiable need for more applause comes but back. Isn't, isn't some degree of that probably pretty common in highly accomplished politicians and for that matter, highly accomplished entertainers and so on? I mean, the, the super high achievers in these, these realms where there is public acclamation they need a lot of it, and, 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 the, and the thrill subsides pretty quickly, I would think. Sure, but for anything to really rise to the level of diagnosis, you have to think in terms of, um, is there impairment in your education, occupation, or relationships? And with these folks, you almost always see impairment in relationships intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. They may, depending on the context in which they work, so if they're in a particularly kind of Darwinian dog-eat-dog context where empathy isn't necessarily valued by the corporate culture, they are people who can kind of climb up the ladder by stomping on other people's hands. Uh, And they still rise to some observable level of, of achievement in terms of money, success, public status and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But often their personal lives are still a wreck because they really can't engage in an empathic mutual relationship with another person. Mm-hmm. And so often, as I said, the trigger for therapy is usually somebody threatens to leave them or says, we have to get therapy together because this relationship is all about you all the time and I need something in this relationship for me. Mm-hmm. So. At which point Donald Trump apparently says, okay, sayonara, but uh, rather than turning to therapy, but anyway. So, but it would, you would expect to see interpersonal relationship problems with this mm-hmm. person. 
-hmm. So if you're talking about a person who has kind of a normal, maybe just a little extra but healthy narcissism that lets them be boldly pursuing achievement. Mm -hmm. um, that would be modulated enough so that in their personal relationships they are able to actually maintain a genuine love relationship with their family members or with mm -hmm. a partner. Uh, so it's not so devastating that their life personally is falling apart, right. for example. I think I've heard about Trump that he was actually a somewhat remote father until his kids reached the age when they could become part of the enterprise. I forget exactly how I saw it put. I do, I think at the Republican convention, I don't think he hugged any family members. He definitely kissed his wife European style one, once on each cheek. Uh, I don't think he hugged her. I don't think he hugged his, his uh, daughter. Um, I, uh, not that we can read too much into this, I suppose. But anyway. Right. But also in terms of the, um, the interpersonal relationships, you would think that this is a person who kind of sucks all the air out of the family, that the whole family is there kind of to continue to admire and prop up this person's support. Mm -hmm. And often also with narcissistic personality, you also have some extremely compulsive or what we might call addictive behaviors that are often disavowed. So I see myself on this one side of this sector of my personality that I present to the world mm -hmm. as brilliant, beautiful, good, um, unique, uh, making a contribution in some way to the world that is outstanding. But then I also have this little gambling problem over here, or mm -hmm. I have this or I have this drinking problem, or I'm using pornography compulsively, and when they are doing those activities, or I'm exploiting someone sexually who is outside mm -hmm. of my, my role in my profession or outside of my marriage, you could see those things as sort of disavowed most of the time. They're not repressed, they're not totally unconscious because, you know, the person sees their credit card receipts, they know they went to that casino or that motel or whatever, mm -hmm. and they know they did it, but they don't identify with that sector of their personality. Hmm. So in Trump... In theory, we would call that the vertical split, where... So they don't identify... You, you, you mean they don't identify in the sense that if you said, well, you're addicted to this, they would say no? Is that all you mean? I mean, they know they did it, as you said. Correct. They, okay. Or they would make excuses for it, or they would blame someone else for having lured them into it. Or they would say, well, they would minimize it. Yeah, I did that, but I don't do it very often. That's very rare for me. Yeah. Uh, that's not who I am. He seems to acknowledge addictive tendencies because he chooses not to drink at all. Of course, his brother uh, had real problems and died young, uh, I think, as an alcoholic. Um, I think I even heard he doesn't drink coffee. But uh, so he acknowledges in, in some, Trump, Trump acknowledges in some realms that he has addictive nature. I mean, I, I think the, the sexual, whatever you want to call it, predation or whatever, um, seems to fit that pattern. I mean, the most recent woman to uh, testify was a porn star who, you know, she says she rebuffed his attempts and then she gets a call from some assistant saying, would you take $10,000? You know, and it's like, Donald, let it go. You know, it's like, not going to happen tonight, okay? Um, well, but and then to get back to this, this sort of endless emptiness inside, you know, you can see how all of those, those behaviors or all of those activities are really geared toward trying to fill up that hole that can never be filled. Mm -hmm. And what we also have to think about these things intergenerationally because somebody isn't born a narcissist. You know, like you can't go to the nursery in a hospital and say, oh, well, that one and that one, they're going to be narcissists. Mm -hmm. The rest of you, you're okay. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. So narcissistic parents beget narcissistic children. And what happens, we, now this is psychoanalytic theory, so. Is, it, is this itself very well established empirically that there's actually a correlation intergenerationally? I can't quote you okay. statistics. I, I'm not an empirical psychologist in that way. Okay. 
but I mean, clinically and anecdotally, we certainly see that if if what what generally comes to light eventually over the long term with someone who's even remotely amenable to some kind of therapy, which requires a great deal of patience and empathy on the part of the therapist because this person underneath is so fragile and so willing to just see things as criticism. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really treating them with kid gloves. And the whole, um, the whole realm of psychoanalysis called self psychology actually specializes in the treatment of narcissistic personality, which Freud thought you couldn't do because you couldn't establish enough of a relationship to, to work mm -hmm. it. Um, so it's been shown through self-psychology clinical work that you can treat someone who's narcissistic, but it takes a long time and it takes a lot of being very warm, kind and supportive and empathetic to this person, not to their behaviors now, but toward what it felt like inside to be them. And it's theorized that, you know, all of us come into the world in, a, in some sense the world is us, we are the world, there's not a lot of differentiation between ourselves and the parent who's nursing us, we are just, it's all part of us. And we're omnipotent, and when we're hungry, we cry and magically the food appears. And then, little by little, you begin to realize that, no, you don't actually run the world, and you begin to differentiate from your parent, and your parent begins to allow you to fail a little bit, but there's this critical period around age, like nine months to two years or so, maybe 18 months, where the baby deserves to be applauded. Like, think about taking your first step, and Koa used to talk about the gleam in the parent's eye. You know, you, you go, yay, you, you are so great, look at you. Now, if a third grader is walking, you don't go, yeah, you look at you, you're walking. So it has to be kind of modulated to the developmental stage of the child. Mm -hmm. But if the really small child doesn't get that applause and affection and being told, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you're terrific, you're special, you're my little, you're my little apple of my eye, then the rest of their life they'll go chasing after that because that is the developmental need of the, of the baby who's just beginning to become his or her own little person. So th is this a theory about the development of narcissism specifically? I mean, it would seem to have broader application because there, there is this kind of notion that parents who withhold approval can generate super achieving and desperately achieving kids, right? Right. I mean, there's, it's related on some mm -hmm. level. Um, I mean, if you're only loved for your performance, for your grades, for your mm -hmm. athletic prowess, and you're not loved for who you are, you know, that that sets up someone to actually be more more identified with what they do in the world than just being able to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, woe to the child who's born to, say, you know, an athletic family that goes back generations with trophies or an artistic family and you're just not that thing naturally especially if you have older siblings who are or younger siblings who are right i mean and then you can get into splitting within the family about mm -hmm. the good child and the bad child or the the successful child and then the not successful child so mm -hmm. yeah these things all relate to that but really it starts pretty young it starts really in infancy before the child may even have a vocabulary, but they know whether they're being admired and given that praise that they deserve early on. Mm -hmm. And then little by little, if things are going well, the parent is also beginning to say no to things like the toddler stage where no, you have to go to the bathroom here, you can't mm -hmm. do it anywhere. And so gradually then the child has what we call optimal frustration, but it's laid on top of this foundation of you are special to me, we love you so much. Right. So if, and, and sometimes, you know, you can't, I don't want to fall into the trap of mother blaming or parent blaming that often does happen in some traditional psychiatric models because sometimes a parent simply can't provide it not just won't, but can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if the parent, say the parent went through postpartum depression, or 
the parent is working three jobs just to hold body and soul together and really doesn't have the energy at the end of the day to do the total yay you. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the parent's fault necessarily. Right. But there are parents, I mean, it does roll down the generations in the sense of there are parents who never got it themselves, so they are narcissistically needy. And so the child becomes a narcissistic extension of the parent, and the child's achievements are more important than the child, him or herself, because the parent needs to be seen having a child that's perfect and brilliant and wonderful just like themselves. Mm -hmm. The uh, In the Atlantic piece, uh, I forget who wrote it, but... On Trump's parents, they said they, 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 they ran through this idea that they said was one, one prominent theory about what leads to narcissists, and it sounds more or less like what you were saying. And, and the author said there's no evidence that Trump's mother and father were anything other than loving and supportive. Now, and, and I don't know much about it. I, I, there is one striking anecdote about his father that comes from Ivana, Trump's, I guess, first wife, and, and, and she said, I think it's in her book or something, when Trump brought her to meet the father and maybe the family, they were they went out to dinner. And, you know, the Trump, the Trumps, you know, Donald Trump said, I'll have the steak, and I guess the father said, I'll have the steak. And she said, I'll have the fish. And, oh, I think I read the story. And Trump's father said, no, 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 she'll have the steak. And Ivana said, no, no, I really want the, the, the fish. And he said, no, no, she's having the steak. And I don't have a good interpretation of that, but it suggests to me that that, that's really, that really seems like odd behavior to me. And, 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 it, and, it, and it makes you suspect, if, if that's an accurate report of the anecdote, that there was something about Trump's father that was different from my father. I don't know. Well, I mean, you already have, in any case with someone who's brought up in a family business. Mm -hmm. um, often there are dynamics between, especially a father and a son who's expected to carry on that family business and succeed in that family business. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you also get into a dynamic that's kind of a double bind where that parent wants you to succeed because they want you to take over the family business and carry on their legacy. But because they have their own narcissistic wounding, they may also give you the, the opposite message, which is, but don't exceed me. Mm -hmm. And that double bind can also put a kid in a really tough position because the child, in a sense, is trying to take care of the ego needs of the parent both ways. Like, I will be just like you, Dad, and I will be really successful because that's the only way you're going to really notice me and love me. Mm -hmm. But I won't exceed what you do because then I'll get on your bad side too. So it, it, it puts that child in a mm. box. And whatever their true potential was or their true interests in life are kind of just completely put over to the side and maybe even forgotten about because surviving in that family means conforming to a certain expectation. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly. So you see why a person then with these kinds of, of dynamics going on inside of them would find it really psychologically threatening to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Omnipotence is the only way to survive on some level. You have to control everything because there's so many minefields that if you don't control things, you're going to blow yourself up. Yeah, isn't there also just a certain amount of kind of maybe more straightforward, you know, emulation of parents I mean just compliance with the pattern they set like my father is a severe you know uncomplaining whatever and I'm gonna be like that maybe partly to win his approval but it's kind of straightforward I mean yeah I mean on some level the reality that you live with as the smaller child especially you don't know what other people's families feel like you don't know what other realities are this is how you are when you're grown up and you right. it's what you internalize because it's what's there in front of you mm -hmm. but if there's enough space to be yourself you should be able to differentiate and become yourself and by adolescence there should be some kind of normal space for that child to begin to say wait a minute you know these are the things I like about dad these are the things I'm not so sure about 
And that rebellion on some level, I'm not talking about, you know, setting the house on fire, but some level of rebellion is actually healthy because it's, it's this person beginning to assert their own well, sense of who well, they Trump are. Trump had a kind of rebellion. I mean, they had to send him to a military school to, you know, teach him the fundamentals of, of uh, you know, behavior. But, uh, well, let's... Um, well, you know, that kind of thing is interesting, too, because it's saying we can't deal with this anymore. Mm -hmm. We have to send you off to some place that will mold you the way we want you to be molded. Mm -hmm. I'm not assuming everybody who sends their kids to an academy is in that category, but um, I mean, it, it, it seems like from the things you're saying, just on the face of it, that this, there's some lack of empathy going on at the parental level for young Donald. And wouldn't shock me. I mean, the presentations of his father, you, you do get a, a, a general sense of austerity about the father, I think. So um, you want to turn quickly to the other side of you, the ministerial or pastoral side? Do you have anything as a, uh, you, you know, and, and, and I, I also want to say, kind of by way of transition, we sound like, maybe I sound like a bit kind of hard on Donald Trump and kind of, you know, condescending and harsh in judgment, maybe. I just want to say this is not the same as uh, my evaluation of him does not necessarily coincide with my evaluation of his followers, who are themselves a disparate group. But I, I don't mean I don't mean to sound dismissive and condescending toward everything that we label that that that, that, that comes under the label of kind of a Trumpism or, or whatever. But he clearly is himself a distinctive uh, person, an, an interesting person. Um, well, you know, as, as I wrote about in a blog for the Huff Post, I, I see the dynamics of the movement that's, that's attracted to him as being um, very similar to other mass movements behind leaders who tap a certain vein of, of frustration and feeling impotent and disempowered and saying, you know, stick with me, I will lead you out of this feeling that you have and I will make things right again. Mm -hmm. And you can see that on any on any side of the political spectrum, that dynamic happening where where people and and Freud in his group psychology and the dynamics of the ego talks about this as clearly as anybody about the ways in which we invest our own ego in this ego ideal that we kind of turn our super ego over to this person who then absolves us for, of responsibility for the bad things we might do in the name of this cause. So, for example, I mean, an extreme example of the rise of National Socialism at the end of the 1920s. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ground was already laid in terms of all kinds of economic frustration, all kinds of um, fear of the other, the xenophobia that was happening as there were increasing migrations from um, mainly Eastern Europe at that point, who were Jewish, uh, and and wanting a scapegoat. And so when people then began to do things like smashing people's businesses or burning their books, they felt like they didn't have to feel guilty about that because they were following this leader who had given them permission to overtly express what they were already inwardly feeling as resentments. Mm -hmm. And I do see some parallels, and not only in our country, but I see them going on all over Europe right now with the rise of right-wing nationalism. You know, people like Hofer in Austria, like Marine Le Pen in France, who are polling, you know, in the upper 20s to 30 percent mm -hmm. in popularity now, or even more. Yeah. So this is part of a, of a, you could say, a mass psychology also that's going on with a lot of similar precursors to things that happened in history before. Yeah, I guess the good news for America 
is that, objectively speaking, the economic dislocation here has not been nearly severe as it was in Germany at the time. Right. I mean, if you just look at, like, unemployment stats and so on, now that's not necessarily the end of the story in terms of what's leading to certain kinds of psychological stress, I guess, but um, you would hope that... If you have someone who's feeding you, things are terrible, things right. are awful now, right. then you can begin to believe that it's worse than it is. Yeah. So what about the Christian charity or, or any other aspect of a Christian perspective on him or his followers? Well, I really, I, I separate those two things, I think, because I think he is a demagogue. Um, but the main difference between, you know, a, a, a demagogue and someone who is just blowing hot air is that a demagogue actually has followers. Hmm. So that reinforces his his sense of I'm onto something here. I'm I'm I've got a cause that's right because look at all of these people who are cheering for me. Mm -hmm. So that reinforces his narcissism and his sense of a mission. I don't believe that his followers are for the most part probably narcissistically impaired. I, I think it's a different dynamic that's going on there that has more to do with very conscious levels of frustration and disempowerment and expressing it this way. Um, and in terms of the group dynamic, to a lesser extent, I also saw that with Bernie Sanders, that he also was tapping some serious discontent and frustration with the way things are, but from a completely different political perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as, it, you know, if, if, if Donald Trump or another person who was like him was in my congregation or had come to me to talk about their discontent about things, let's say. I mean, it, it's very hard because if the veneer is one of arrogance and superiority, then very quickly in the counseling relationship also comes this arrogance and superiority and they begin to kind of put you down as the counselor and make it hard for you to actually form a relationship. And so I think having that understanding that underneath all this bravado is this, this insatiable empty hole and this one year old who never got yeah. given the, the applause and the gleam in the parent's eye, I can relate to the one year old that's underneath there. Mm -hmm. And from a theological perspective, I imagine that anybody who is narcissistic or even sociopathic, God, from my point of view, if, if God is, a, is the, the force or the flow or the energy of love and, and justice in the universe, then I think God is seeing through to the wounded one-year-old, not just seeing you know, the blustering person who's standing in front of me now. Mm -hmm. So as a pastor, as a priest, I want to try to remind myself one time this person was a really little person who never said, I want to grow up to be this arrogant mm -hmm. SOB. I, you know, nobody has that ambition. And had you been in that person's shoes, you would have wound up that person almost by definition. Well, you know, different <laughs> different kinds of disorders come out of similar backgrounds. We can never predict which kind of neurosis or which kind of disorder is going to come. Mm -hmm. Another person in that circumstance actually, on some level, a personality disorder is a narcissism is more structured and more functional in the world than someone, for example, who just simply becomes massively clinically depressed right. because their anger is so squelched and their true personality is so squelched and you can't hate the parent because that's completely unacceptable not even thinkable mm -hmm. so you begin to turn that inward on yourself and become very depressed so another child might react that way but so they would all be reacting as human beings to the this, this situation right. they're in and, th and that's the source of understanding that can be a source of love can can uh... that's right Mm -hmm. And I think it is what allows therapists to work with narcissistic personality. The, the self-psychologists 
who do that as a specialty, I think they have to really ground themselves in some sense of compassion for the person who's wounded underneath, mm -hmm. because otherwise you would just want to throw the person out of your office. I mean, right. it, so we end on a note of compassion for Donald Trump. That you are allowed to do by the rules of your profession, I suppose, is profess <laughs> compassion without having had an in-office interview with him. Um, well, thank you, Pam. Now, where uh, can people go to find your work? You do write for Huffington Post every once in a while, right? They can go there and Google your name. Yeah, not, not as often as I should, but um, I'm a blogger for them. Um, I mean, I have several books. You can go to my Amazon uh, author page and see what I've written there. Google, Google Pamela Cooper White. Well, thank you for all the... Uh... And let me, let me just say, on November 5th at 4 o'clock, I'll be at Lincoln Center as part of the White Light Festival on a panel talking about um, our humanity, past, present, and future. And so anyone who's in the New York area, I would welcome them to come to that event. It's free. Is that in the evening? It is at 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock, and a couple of days before the election, so... <laughs> yeah, we, we will, everyone will need a break from election, uh, from the endless news about the election campaign so okay he chose the topic actually on the basis of the lack of civility and the the degradation of American public discourse and so they wanted to have a panel talking about what does it mean to be human uh -huh. in this age so it's actually quite timely well and I'm afraid it will remain that for some time I don't think the problem of uh, incivility is going to go away after the election but we're, we're, we're all probably more acutely aware of it by virtue of the election. So thank you so much, Pam, and, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk again. All right. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Bye-bye.